So we've had uh, a series of interesting opening remarks. And uh, what I want to do is press back against each of you briefly and uh, offer you an opportunity to respond. And then we're going to open it up to questions uh, from all of you. So uh, first, Professor Cavallaro. Uh, one question that you, su you suggested at one point, perhaps what we need is a international convention addressing drones. You reference as a possible comparison point the chemical and bio biological weapons conventions. Now, Matt, on the other hand, uh, raised the question, is it really the technology that's the problem? Right? So, so is it really drones that are the concern? Are these simply just a step further along, a long-standing move uh, towards the ability to project force uh, at a distance? You know, you have a history of developing military uh, armaments as a history of being able to project force further and further away? Is this really just a kind of one step further down the continuum, not all that different really from cruise missiles? So is it really the technology that's the problem? And if so, what is it that's special about the technology? And if it's not the technology that's the problem, but it's the policies, then should we be focusing, instead of having a conference about drones, should we really be having a, a conference about the international law and domestic law issues that are raised by this particular use of this technology, which you could use any number of technologies in this way, right? So, so that's my question uh, to you. Um, to uh, Gabor Rona, um, so you raise a bunch of really hard uh, and interesting questions, both international law questions and domestic law questions. Um, one small question uh, I have for you is you raise both the law of armed conflict. You say law of armed conflict is relevant here. Human rights law is also relevant here. Uh, but you know uh, probably better than anyone in this room um, that human rights law generally is not understood to apply in instances where uh, a state does not exercise effective control over the territory in which they're acting. Um, and if that's the case, then really do we need to be focusing on law of armed conflict as opposed to human rights law, or is there still some space for human <laughs> rights law, and if so, what would that be? Uh, the second question I have for you is that both the questions you raise around international law and domestic law and, and what are kind of a broadening of the application and use of both international law and domestic law in this context seem to me to turn on the, um, the decision of first the Bush administration, then the Obama administration, to apply the authorization for use of military force to associated forces, not simply to the Taliban and al-Qaeda, but to all those who are associated with them. And so this interpretation of the authorization of use of military force to extend associated forces, um, which then also is understood to give you an extension of authority under international law and engage in self-defense against anyone affiliated with al-Qaeda, because al-Qaeda has attacked the homeland. Right? So is it really that that's the, in some sense, the, the, the fulcrum on which the internet, the, both the international law and domestic law errors turn. That is, this, this claim that we have legal authority both as a matter of international law and as a, as a matter of domestic law to go against associated forces, which in turn is built on a reading of co-belligerency theory, as you know, right? of the idea that we can go against anyone who is essentially partnered with our enemies, right? Who, who, has a, who has an association with our enemies sufficient that they essentially become, uh, become co-belligerents along with those enemies. So is that really, in the end, the, the fulcrum on which both of these legal errors turn? And if so, could we maybe make some progress by really focusing on that and making that, and making that clear? If that's not the case, then what is the, what's the source of the, of the legal mistakes? Um, Matt, you very helpfully, I think, uh, separate out the concerns, the issues here, because there's a, ten there's a tendency in this area to kind of conflate the kinds of problems. So you, you helpfully separate out the technological platform, which I thought was a very helpful point, the policy of targeted killing, um, which is, turns in, in some sense to the questions I was just raising to Gabor, and the questions of oversight. Um, so these are questions of secrecy and transparency. Um, you very carefully then don't, uh, didn't take a position as to whether there are problems any, in any of these areas, and if so, where they might lie. You suggested um, that the technological platform isn't really the problem, because the truth is that this is just a, it's just a species of a problem that, that just, it's not about the technology, it's the use of the technology that's the problem. That would then suggest, and you said that oversight 
it's not legally, transparency is not legally required, but it might be as a policy matter a good idea. So that suggests then that it was the second category, the policy of targeted killing, that might be where the problems lie. If that's the case, then um, I'd encourage you to say something about what, what, if anything, is wrong with the policy of targeted killing. Um, and uh, and is, does that connect to some degree to the, some of the issues raised by uh, Gabor in particular around the legal issues of international legal authority and domestic <coughs> legal authority? And then finally, Bruce, um, you raise a lot of uh, very um, uh, cogent concerns with the policy of targeted killing. Um, and in particular concerns around due process of the targeted killing program. Uh, but I have two questions. Uh, first, uh, what is the solution? Right? So we can talk about what the problem is. The problem is the absence of, target, uh, of, the absence of due process in the process of, of targeted killing. That suggests that a process, if we gave due process, then it would be okay. And so I guess the question I would ask for you is, how would we go about doing that? Um, how would we provide due process? So there are a lot of different proposals kind of out there on the table. So one possibility that's been raised is a drones court, as some have called it, um, either inside or outside of the executive branch. Um, another suggestion that's been raised is uh, it's the, the, when somebody goes on the targeted killing list, it ought to be reviewed by the Article, Article Three courts. Another possibility, I suppose, would be open transparency, but of course, there's all kinds of obvious problems with that, which is it's difficult to be to make transparent the fact you're putting somebody on the targeted killing list uh, when uh, you don't necessarily want them to know that as a matter of military policy. And maybe the answer is too bad, and we have to do that, uh, and and that's what's necessary as a matter of due process. But I guess I would ask you to kind of go the next step to say not only what's the problem, if the absence of due process is the problem, how do we get sufficient due process? And do you really believe that impeachment power is the only check? I mean, I think you can't believe that, because the <coughs> truth is that if impeachment power is the only check, what do you do? You have the next person come to office. This is not just an Obama administration policy. It was a Bush administration policy, and whoever comes next is likely to be in the same position. So simply removing the person in power without changing the institutional structure within which they're operating is not going to be sufficient to change the dynamic that we find ourselves in, which is a variety of problems. One is uh, a perceived extensive threat. Um, another is Congress has kind of been paralyzed and unable to step up for itself and, and claim the powers that it, that it ought to claim uh, on these issues. And, and if you're not fixing that and if you're not putting in place an alternative institutional structure, is removing the president in power now really going to get you anywhere? Um, uh, is it just going to be the next person that's going to end up falling into all the same traps? So that's just to get us your started. Your question is entirely uh, fair, and it's something that comes up a lot. How much of this is, is the technology? How much of this is targeted killing? And obviously, both are highly relevant. But if I disaggregate and answer how much of this is about technology, a significant part is. And I agree with what, what Matt said about, and, and what you said as well, that this is a weapon. It's a particular weapon, it's a tool. It can be used effectively, it can be used ineffectively. Uh, the laws of war don't hinge on, uh, necessarily on the tool. Necessarily, I'll underscore that because there are many exceptions, including chemical and biological weapons, nuclear weapons, et cetera. Weapons that are not capable of making the distinction that are indiscriminate. Uh, so the weapon can matter. Here's why I think drones should worry us in particular, and I'll say it at a couple of different levels. Yes, drones are the latest and uh, most extreme development on a continuum in which what has happened is technology has permitted m massive force to be used, possibly within the framework of existing laws of war, so there, there's the capability of distinction as opposed to chemical weapons or nuclear weapons, which do not distinguish and which makes them illegal, but it's, it's the continuum where the great lethal force can be exercised without any potential cost to the state or party that uses the weapon. And I think what that does is it undermines the fundamental balance, which is, I believe, presupposed into our theory of just war and, by extension, into international humanitarian law, the laws of war. Uh, so that should concern us in terms of rendering law uh, or rendering warfare fundamentally uneven. The second concern has to do with our constitutional structure, and these issues have been, have been addressed. 
We have observed an accretion of power by the executive in matters related to war. Uh, and what we see in real time is that because of drones, the, the, the president and the executive branch are able to maintain a half dozen simultaneous uh, theaters of engagement, right? Yemen, Somalia, uh, Mali. Uh, Pakistan, Mali. You, know, you, can, you can add Afghanistan, Iraq, where there, there are armed conflicts, et cetera, without going to Congress. You mentioned, Bruce, that Clinton went to Congress, didn't get the authorization over Kosovo, and proceeded. Uh, that, as I recall, because I watched it in real time on a daily basis, we've had information about the, sort, about the sorties and the flights and, and the bombs dropped, et cetera. These are low-level conflicts with high-level consequences to people on the ground that are occurring in real time with virtually no oversight. The threat to our constitutional process is quite severe, and I would say, even though it's a, it's a, it's a continuum, the nature of drones, uh, uh, one could argue, make this of a different order. Uh, and then there's also the threat, uh, I would say, to, to, to global peace and to uh, international relations, uh, the facility that drones provide for all states to kill potential enemies without the threat to their own troops or their own forces, which is a, con a significant constraint on the use of military force, is something that sh should concern us. So while it is a continuum, and I agree, and while it is just a particular tool and could be understood that way within the existing legal framework of international humanitarian law, there are elements that make it sufficiently distinct that we should be worried about drones and weaponized drones in, in particular ways. Fantastic, very helpful. So, Una, you asked me two questions, so I'm going to start by answering neither of them. Because <laughs> um, I really want to weigh in on... on True politics. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll get to the... One politician would admit it. Um, the, the, the question of, of, of um, is it the technology or, or is it something else? I just, I wanted to weigh in on that. Um, Matt was talking about um, other precedents for, uh, you know, firepower that the United States or other, others have, have been using. Um, that creates new imbalances between parties to, to armed conflict. Um, you don't have to start with, uh, you know, with cruise missiles. You can go back 100 years to the advent of aerial warfare where somebody got the bright idea that they could drop a bomb from a balloon. And when that, when that, came, it, that reality came into being, it ignited an entire debate about whether or not this is a game changer that requires, um, you know, throwing out the old rule books um, and, and promulgating some new visions of what is appropriate in, in armed conflict. There have been gradual changes in the, in the nature of international law related to the conduct of hostilities, but drones are not such a game changer. They do present opportunities that are unprecedented for a party to armed conflict to stay out of harm's way. That in and of itself is not new. What I think is new is the combination of that fact along with the changing nature of the conflict. The changing nature of the conflict is that we no longer have a blue army lined up against a gray army and no, uh, if we're not colorblind, who it is that, that we want to target. <laughs> The combination of the changes in technology and the changes in, in the nature of warfare are indeed a game changer. However, I don't think that mandates uh, the uh, new law. The law is okay. The law says you can fire at combatants in armed conflict, you can't fire at civilians. The law says if you're not in armed conflict, you can only kill people if they pose an imminent threat to bodily harm which cannot be ameliorated otherwise. This law is still good. Now, as to the, the question um, of, um, well, I'll take the, the first one, one first about the interplay between human rights law and, and IHL. It's absolutely true that while human rights law standards and law of armed conflict standards 
should take care of what it is that we need to be taken care of in all circumstances, because you either have um, the law of armed conflict applying in armed conflict situations, or you have human rights law, which creates um, higher impediments to killing. But Una is, ac is absolutely right um, that the United States, at least, does not acknowledge the applicability of its human rights law obligations in a couple of respects. In one respect, the U.S. is a very significant outlier from the international community on this question. Um, the European Court, under the European Convention, has made it quite clear that states have extraterritorial human rights obligations. When they, when they act outside their own territory, their human rights obligations come along with them. <coughs> the United States rejects this view. The fact that the United States rejects this view is what, what creates the lacuna. But the answer is not to bring in more or an expanded uh, vision of the application of the laws of war, which lowers the threshold for killing. The answer is simply before our face, that the United States needs to do what the rest of the world that has and recognizes human rights obligations is doing, which is to acknowledge the existence and the application of those human rights law obligations wherever they act. So, Bart, can I interrupt you there for a second? Because even the European Court of Human Rights effective holds control. that it's only in, states, in instances where they exercise effective control, which um, would not be the case in most of the places in which the U.S. is using drones. So even if we took the ECHR uh, standard and, and assumed that that was the right <coughs> standard, um, even then you wouldn't say it. This is a relatively small point, but I think it's not, it's not it's not irrelevant to judging what the right way of acting is. Um, even then, you would not say human rights law applies unless you exercise effective control, which the U.S. obviously doesn't do in, say, Yemen, um, right? So, so that even if you were even if you were taking the the European standard. So even if it. yeah. So even if you went to the extent of the European standard, if 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 the United States were were to do that, there would still be circumstances under that standard, um, in in which human rights law would not be deemed to apply. That, I think, is a mistake still of the application of, of human rights law. The answer cannot be, well, in that case, we'll apply the law of armed conflict, because the law of armed conflict's application depends on the existence of war, on the existence of armed conflict. And it is simply impossible to construct a human protective scheme in which you fill lacuna by the standard of, of targetability that creates lower rather than higher impediments to killing people. The answer, I think, has to be that where a state acts in the absence of armed conflict, it has to have human rights obligations applied to it. The European Court has not yet gotten there. But I think the time will have to come where whenever a state is acting extraterritorially, whether it has effective control over a particular territory or not, it's going to have to be deemed to be subject to human rights law obligations. It simply cannot be the case that there is a legal black hole in which states can, with impunity, go about killing and detaining people without due process simply because they're doing it not only outside their own territory, but also on territory in which they don't exercise effective control. Um, I think I'll leave the associated forces question um, maybe for a little bit later, except That's to- That's the hard one. <laughs> that is the hard one. Um, except to say that um, this is an example of a number of ways in which the United States has taken concepts from a very different and traditional kind of war, one where you have recognized armies and recognized differences between combatants and civilians, and simply by fiat, try to transpose those rules which work in those kinds of conflicts into these newer kinds of conflicts in which the distinction between combatant and civilian is much more difficult to ascertain. So, um, Ona, you mentioned that in traditional law, of armed conflict, you have the concept of co-belligerency in which, you know, the friend of my enemy is, is my enemy. And that's okay when a, a state is taking part on one side of an armed conflict and you can tell 
who all of the combatants and who all the civilians are. But to take that concept of co-belligerency from wars between states and to simply transpose it without any fine tuning to the concept of armed conflicts involving non-state armed groups and calling them associated forces for the purpose of authorizing killing anybody who not only may be a member of al-Qaeda, whatever that means, or a member of an organization that is associated with al-Qaeda, whatever associated means, is simply to wipe out any semblance of rule, um, of being bound by law or being bound by rules on the question of killing. Thank you. Matt? Uh, thanks. So let me make a, a, a point or set of points about the technology issue and a, a set of points about the, 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 the targeting policy. With regard to the technology, one of the themes that's come up here, and it worries me, is this idea that, um, well, I, actually, I agree with this part, that we need to think carefully about uh, constraints on the use of force uh, because we generally we want there to be a presumption a strong presumption against the use of force um, but just as there is a danger of of the United States or other states using too much force there's also a danger of it using too little force not only to deal with true threats but also to deal with other problems like the perpetration of of genocide and I think the the, the way we try to get uh, uh, that uh, uh, that right level of force is a combination of a number of factors, including uh, political factors, diplomatic factors, legal factors. And the, 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 the idea that we should cali we can calibrate the right level of force by uh, I, I foregoing technologies that, uh, I, I, that reduce risk to our service members uh, bothers me, it worries me a lot from a policy standpoint and a moral standpoint. Uh, I, I don't think that's the right way to go about uh, uh, deterring the use of force uh, uh, to uh, 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 prohibit technologies that reduce uh, uh, risk to our, to our troops. Uh, uh, with regard to uh, uh, policy, uh, you asked what sort of where do I come out on this and, 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 and what do, do I think there's a, a problem? Yes, I, I do think there's a couple of problems uh, with our targeting uh, our targeted killing uh, policy, and I, I, I put them in, in two categories. One is my sense is that it probably is, a, as a strategic matter, too broad. Uh, I think we probably are, uh, I, uh, in order to get short-term gains, using the tool too much and causing long-term damage, long-term damage in terms of uh, the kinds of, of extremism that may be generated by the use of targeted killing strikes, uh, also by I, 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 this relates to my next point, I, I, I think blurring some of the, the, the legal and normative standards in a way that's, that's dangerous to us. I, I, I mean, in, in, in addition to being problematic from perhaps from a, a legal standpoint, from a humanitarian standpoint, I think it may also come back to, to hurt us in the end. And, and, and that's what I would, would want to emphasize here is that I think the United States I, I, has failed to uh, uh, articulate uh, uh, sufficiently clearly and then demonstrate its adherence to some principled limits on some of the questions especially that Gabor has raised. Uh, uh, who can be targeted? What kind of threat would rise to the threshold uh, against which we would use uh, uh, force? So how do we think about questions like imminence? And, and let me mention here two lessons of my own from my time in government that I think are, 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 are factors or, 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 or sources of this problem. One is I think when you're inside the government, you think you sound more reasonable and principled than you do. Uh, I, uh, it's, it's when you're reading, you, you know, the speech, and you're, you're writing the speech. It sounds, it sounds much more reasonable, and it sounds much more, I, I think, constraining, limiting than it does to the the outside audience that's that's hearing it. And so I think, whereas the Obama administration probably it's committed to being more transparent and and articulating more clearly the boundaries, the legal boundaries, the 
ethical boundaries of its targeting policy. I think to, to many people on the outside, they're not they're they're not hearing this as sounding very limited. I, I, another another issue is that the the United States government, in particular, I think, tends to be very good at explaining its legal authorities, but they're not so good at explaining the limits. And I think what often tends to happen is that the and and, and we've seen it in some of the speeches about targeting. The United States government uh, senior officials will go out and they'll say things like, uh, uh, "We can use." Uh, uh, lethal force against high-level Al Qaeda planners, and maybe give a little bit of a, a detail as to as to who can be targeted. But then, if you said, "Well, okay, I understand you think you can target leaders, but what about lower-level fighters such as X?" The answer will be, "Well, we're not going to talk about hypotheticals." Uh, uh, and part of part of the reason for that, I think, internally, is to say, uh, uh, "Well, let's." We probably wouldn't do that anyway. But why, why, uh, why, why, why constrain ourselves? Uh, 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 why should you know? Maybe there is a hypothetical in which we might want to do that, and we might even think that it's uh, uh, legal, or there might be a, 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 an available legal argument. I think that I think it's dangerous, and I think uh, I, I, uh, the uh, uh, the strategic danger in failing to articulate those limits comes back to to haunt us. Uh, down the road. It comes back to haunt us uh, 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 in part because we end up eroding some of these uh, uh, principles like uh, 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 humanitarian, international humanitarian law uh, uh, principles that, we, that, that, that are important uh, uh, to protecting us, our citizens, but also to, to, uh, uh, to, to implementing uh, a human rights agenda that we have. Uh, I think it's also dangerous because uh, uh, of some of the, the issues that have been raised before in that it, it, it interferes with our ability to, uh, uh, to condemn practices by others. Great. Bruce? The, the first question, well, what is the model that should be employed uh, in confronting a post-9-11 world? I don't think we need to invent it. We did use it against American Taliban. His name was John Walker Lind. I think he's now spending 20 years in prison. We actually charged him with a crime. He was prosecuted across the river of Potomac in the Eastern District of Virginia. He was sentenced under Robert. civilian civilian criminal law, and he's in prison. Uh, shortly thereafter, we had someone who was called the 20th hijacker, Zacharias Musawi, who was also prosecuted in a civilian court right across the Potomac River. The jury was given an option to sentence him to death or to life imprisonment. They chose life imprisonment. He's now serving time. Uh, and in a larger scale, I think, the way to approach the culprits of 9-11, similar but not quite as aggressive as the way Israel treated those who were implicated in the Olympic Munich massacres of 1972. Uh, we surely have a right, charge them. We have the evidence like we did against Musawi with crimes. In fact, we're going to try Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in the civilian court till <coughs> the backbone left uh, the attorney general. He charged them with crimes, and then with regard to law enforcement, you can use deadly force to kill someone whose escape, if he's fleeing, would create a serious danger uh, to physical injury or death of another. And that's Israeli, Israel got, I think, all the Munich plus one that they shouldn't have gotten. Uh, that is the way in which we should have approached 9-11. It was mass murder, not war. In fact, that was the count against Musawi. 3,000 counts of homicide. So we don't need to invent it. Now some could say, well, wouldn't that be you know, riskier than being preemptive, looking and seeing, well, there's Al Qaeda who harbors resentment against the United States, so why don't we kill them before they can do anything bad to the United States? That's not who we are. That's the whole idea of due process. You actually don't get to take preemptive action before someone who's shown by their actions, they're inclined and likely imminently to create a danger to the United States. Can and I press back on, you, sure. on this for a moment? Because so I agree with you completely when it comes to people who are currently within our custody. But uh, what would you say if the U.S. has good intelligence that there's someone either planning or has already planned and carried out uh, attacks against the United States? They're in, let's say, Waziristan and we know where they are. Um, now, I don't think you would say, though maybe you would, 
we should send in the troops, grab him, and bring him home. Uh, and try him. I don't. I don't. I suspect that's not what you would no, say. No. What, what right? I would do. What we did with Osama bin Laden before 9/11, we had a grand jury indict him for conspiring to destroy defense facilities or otherwise. He was indicted. Once you have an indictment, you can send in the FBI or even the military to seek capture of someone abroad if there's not an extradition treaty. And if they flee and you have to kill them in order to prevent their danger to someone else, that's what is permitted. And you can use the military, consistent with the Constitution, to capture someone who is indicted. In contrast, let's think of Mr. al -Aki. No accusation of any kind that he had committed any crime whatsoever. Nothing. We just incinerated him. And it suddenly became a crime, in the words of John Yu, to be associated with a possible danger, you know, even though it's uncharged. You know, well, listen, if your description of the events that you describe was true, there'd be lots of evidence to get a grand jury indictment. You're not shielded from US law because you're plotting outside the United States to commit harm inside. If you're standing across the border in Mexico and ready to shoot someone in the United States, yeah, you can be <laughs> captured and tried and convicted. So let me make this harder for you, though. Um, it, because, so say you have a grand jury indictment. Um, now, do you then propose, so, so with, tar with using drones, you don't actually have to put US, U.S. boots on the ground. To actually capture him, if that's what you're saying is necessary, um, you actually, you would have to put U.S. boots on the ground in Waziristan, which is politically... No, but well, out, out, out we, we put boots on the ground in, in trying to capture Osama bin Laden, right? And that's some of the, and what you do is, yeah, you sometimes, in order to respect due process, you maybe have to do politically uncomfortable things. So what? That's who we are as United States citizens. It does, doesn't bother me in the slightest. Uh, and the, the fact is you can go in to foreign countries when there's not cooperation. In what the U.S. Supreme Court has said, kidnap people. There may be kidnap violation. You can bring them back to the United States for justice. We did that in the 1989s, I think, that someone who was complicit in airline hijacking, I think it was Fawaz, I can't, I can't pronounce his name, he was tricked to go to Cyprus. We captured him there, brought him back to Washington, D.C., and tried him. So what's wrong with that? We don't need to invent the wheel. It's already there. And what's stunning to me is that when President Obama was discussing his urgent enthusiasm for creating a legal structure to justify predator drones use, he didn't ask himself, well, maybe I should have had a legal structure before I started the predator drones rather than afterwards. That's sort of the way you do it in the United States. And the Senate Judiciary Committee that held oversight hearings equally complacent with Obama saying, ah, we don't want to, we can't decide what the legal authority is. We won't testify at all. I mean, this is a president who's following an example of President Ford who testified on pardoning Nixon. And now we have a president, I don't want to talk about killing other people without any due process. That seems to me intolerable. Then we get to the, the question, the, Second question was impeachment. I was involved in Nixon. I can tell you for a fact, President Reagan oftentimes thought, I don't want to be impeached like Nixon. You know? so the idea that a president would be insouciant about getting a second impeachment power is nonsense. Remember Samuel Johnson? The knowledge that a man may be hanged in a fortnight concentrates his mind wonderfully. And there are lots of presidents <laughs> post-Nixon who said, I can't go there because I'm worried about impeachment. That once a president was actually held to account, it would be a century would elapse before any other president even contemplated going near the edge. It is an effective deterrent. All right. Well, we're going to stop there and open it up to all of you. Hopefully you'll have uh, pressing questions.